Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 37 of Future Tech Talk. Who knew that we would make it this far? It is a beautiful day down here at the ballpark, and I am in a better mood this week. I don't know how <laughs> reflective that will be in today's topics, but, you know, I'll try my best. I know I'm not the most investigative journalist archetype in this space. I don't dive too deep into details because, truth be told, I think ignorance is bliss to some extent. And, and I think it's fun to talk about things on the peripheral because there's just so much to talk about. So yesterday, I saw an article about a cartoon that was being made by AI in China. In the sense that this Chinese lab has created these short stories only using AI. And maybe the details are a little hard to understand because of translation issues and things along those lines. But from what I gathered, the lab was created six months ago. Now, I don't know if it took them six months to create these cartoons because that sort of puts it on at least a similar timeline to traditional processes. These cartoons are only like seven minutes long and they're set up around these ancient uh, poems from their culture. And again, it's really kind of hard to understand how they used AI to make it because the article claimed or the video claimed that it was made in a similar fashion as OpenAI Sora, but I feel like if an AI, even if it was in China, was capable of doing that, it would have been much bigger news. I don't know if that's the case. Again, the information implied that it was made through text-to-video, and just from observing it, I don't think that's true. It looked to me, at least, that it was image-to-video. So perhaps they use an art generator to create the, the pieces, the illustration, and then I don't know what tools China has access to, but you can imagine something like Runway ML to create these camera effects. And then honestly, something like After Effects to put it all together. Like, it looks traditional enough to where you don't think it had to be made by AI, but is that the real goal of these AI technologies, is to produce things that we could already produce i don't i don't quite know it's, it's the cartoon wasn't doing anything extraordinary it was well done and it, and it captured a very specific style sort of like a a cutout illustration book sort of it had very rudimentary movement no visible glitches and then you have to wonder well how much post-processing went into it how how much did they cover up so to say it's all ai generated i don't know however Still very impressive. It impresses me that it came from a lab, not like a production company using AI. It came from a lab creating AI, as far as I understand it. And it's airing on Chinese state TV. Basically, it's being used to educate children on these old poems from their culture, like I mentioned. And I thought that was just really fascinating. It's a really cool way of using AI. And it kind of blew my mind that, again, it was the lab creating the cartoon. Could you imagine OpenAI creating their own entertainment? I don't know. Is it? Maybe it's edutainment, education and entertainment. Because like OpenAI is creating tools, but wouldn't it be really interesting if they felt the need to create with it as well? I don't get the sense that that's their motive or that they're taking on any of that inspiration themselves. They're happy to create the tools. And you know what, this goes for Runway ML, this goes for any lab. It's really, really interesting that no North American lab, again, just based on my knowledge, has taken the burden on themselves to create with their products. They're happy to create the tools and the service, but they're not using it themselves. And you'd think that the creator of the tools would be the most fit to use them in a productive way. I just thought that was a cool dichotomy between how our companies seem to use the technology over here versus just a, a piece of news that we hear about from overseas. But to relate to OpenAI <laughs> in some way is that I feel like I'm permanently in the exploration phase. Like, to take six months to create an AI cartoon, that just that doesn't seem like it's even close to a top priority for me for a few reasons one being that the technology changes so quickly so do you really want to be working on 
old workflows when in a few months it's all going to get upended and it, like there's really no guarantee that the way you use the technology before would even be available to you and that reminds me of something i heard on the corridor digital channel i think this was like a vfx artist react or maybe it was an animators react and they were interviewing and going over the work of a disney animator and something that stuck out to me was how their talent level grew during the production of some of these films so the first drawings that they would make in in the animation weren't as good as the animations they drew near the end of the production because they got better at it so if you watched a movie sure you wouldn't know what they drew first but there are like different timelines of talent in the same movie and that sort of applies to ai if you started a long enough project there would be clear instances where your talent and the ai's talent would not overlap like there would be a difference perhaps it would be really noticeable when you worked on certain parts of the project so again, I feel like I'm permanently in an exploration phase. I don't think any idea I have is good enough for me to stop everything and focus on it. Not that I don't have good ideas, but I think it's because I have too many good ideas. You'll hear that a lot, that ideas are cheap, ideas are a dime a dozen. And it's really true. If you can tap into having a good idea, you'll do it again. It's not, it's not impossible. The best ideas, sure, maybe they're a little more rare, but something worth working on like, if you write stories, if you write novels, if you write scripts, you probably have hundreds of ideas. Like, it's a reflex. It'll just come to you. And, and it feels sort of similar to the idea of getting a tattoo. Like, I think tattoos are cool. Obviously, you can see how beautiful they are. But I would never get one because I could never decide on what I... No idea was ever important enough to get tattooed on me. And that might be a little abstract metaphor or analogy, but the same sort of thing applies to AI at the moment, where I do get quite a few comments, or at least I did, of, you know, what do you do with all these pictures? Like, what are you doing with AI? And my answer was, oh, I'm just exploring so that I can teach other people. And that hasn't changed. Like, that's still my number one priority is just like, oh, can it do this? Can it do that? And when I see other, we'll call them AI artists, but artists who use AI, and they've really focused on one particular style, I'm quite envious of that. To have the, I don't think it's discipline, but to have some sort of internal focus that channels all of your energy into one specific look, I think that's amazing. It looks like you bore the hell out of me, <laughs> honestly. I could never do it. I always want to see what else can it do. What I'm trying to say is that I understand why an AI lab would never use their own tool to create a project, a, a piece of media, because they're probably focused on, okay, we got it to do this, but what else can it do? So to see an AI lab in China create with their tool, I think that's really, really interesting. For lack of a better word, I've said that a few times. And maybe, maybe AI doesn't have to replace people in the sense that maybe creating these short stories based on old cultural poems, maybe they were never going to get made in the traditional way, and that an AI studio could produce these at an affordable cost so that they're worth making. Like, maybe AI will save a lot of these good, but not the most profitable ideas from getting made. Does that make sense? Did I say that correctly? There's a lot of things that you wish would be created, but who's going to give you millions of dollars to create it? Maybe an AI will be able to save some of those ideas. I don't know if that's reviving old shows. I don't know if that's reviving old animated shows that would have 70 episodes in a season. And you're like, our studio's moving on. We can't, we can't do that. But one of the m most famous Netflix memes of the last 10 years is that you don't get a third season. You, you come out with a hot show, some people stick around for season two, but not enough. And by season three, they don't think it's going to be worth it to produce all of that content for the diminishing return, especially because people don't just jump into a season three. You're only, you're only working with portions of your existing audience. Maybe AI could, could entice the financiers 
to finish their stories to as long as there's not a drop in quality but i just i see so many good uses for ai i don't know why so many people are against it it's it's mind blowing okay quick rant about some negativity i saw online but i'm going to try and bring a positive spin i saw a giant post and maybe i should just stop looking i don't know maybe it finds me maybe the algorithm knows i'll react to it nonetheless i saw a post about how ai is killing the value of art because, I'm paraphrasing here, but if everyone can make something, if anyone can make something, then nothing matters. And that effort directly translated to value. Whether you agree with that or not, I don't necessarily agree with it. But what came to my mind is that it was always the people making the art that mattered. It, it didn't have anything to do with the process. I don't think people cared how Beethoven wrote the symphony, just that the symphony was written by Beethoven. Does that make sense? Maybe Shakespeare had a room full of writers. I don't know. Does it matter? If anyone can do it, I want to see what the best people do with it. That probably makes a little bit more sense. Even if AI can create film and anyone can create a movie with AI, I still want to see what James Cameron does. It doesn't matter if your neighbor can create a movie. Who cares? You could do it too. So who cares if your neighbor can do it? But your favorite director, maybe someone you look up to, maybe someone you know that is more creative and artistic than anyone else, you want to see what they do with it. So I don't think AI ruins the value of art because it's always been about the person. And then what I say right now might be a bit controversial, but I want you to know that I don't actually think this, it's just, it was just a thought. It's not a personal belief that I think about every day. So let me just clarify that. But the thought I had was, is that why some artists are scared of AI? Because, because the people they have to compete with just grew exponentially and they don't want to compete? Like, let's take a sport, let's take baseball. If your team had an open tryout everyone in the city could come play, and you were the worst player on your team, you might get a little emotional. You might be a little scared, or really scared, because it's like pretty clear that you're going to have to compete, and there's like a good chance someone's going to beat you. Something along those lines. My point is that I don't think the best player on the team is worried. I think if you're ready to compete, and you think you can play well in you're able to block out all the noise and play well regardless of what anyone else does, which is what the best athletes do and it's what the best artists do. If you're able to focus on yourself and just try to become better with the tools at hand, I don't think you're worried about competition. Maybe I can relate this a little bit to YouTube. I don't think the top YouTubers are afraid of other YouTubers. It just, I don't get that vibe. I don't know if I've said this before on this channel, but like I don't watch other YouTubers in my niche in the AI world. I don't want to know what they do. God bless them. I don't want them to influence me. I don't want to have to think about, oh, well, they did this. I'm really just focused on myself. And if I try and play the best that I can play, well, that's literally the only thing I can do. That's the best I can do. Sure, I'll take advice, general advice from other niches and if I see another YouTuber doing something that I like, I'll sort of extract how I could do that on my own channel, but I'm not worried about competition. Like maybe it's just an attitude thing, but is that why some artists are scared because they know their competition is going to rise and they're not focused on themselves. They're focused about what everyone else will be doing. Like I think I saw some drama recently about these little mobs online pressuring artists to put out timelines of their art, like showing how the art was made so that they can prove AI wasn't involved. Time lapses of their art is what I should have said. And if you, if you spend that much time worrying about how someone else is doing something, I just feel like that's a recipe for disaster because like, what does it matter? What, what does it matter how someone else is doing something? unless you're worried about falling behind, but, and I'm not saying this to anyone directly, this is just, again, me on the peripheral sort of observing the, the posts that the algorithm serves to me. If 
instead of trying to drag other people down to your level, I think it's better for you to try and just raise yourself up. Like, okay, hey, this is a great example for video games. Now, I don't know how many of you play video games. There's a lot of relatable lessons. Let's say you're playing a video game with five weapons. Let's say there's a sniper rifle, a machine gun, a submachine gun, a shotgun, and a pistol. Now let's say the machine gun is really strong. It's, it's arguably the strongest and it's what everyone has agreed is the strongest. So everyone you see playing the video game is using the machine gun when there are still four other guns available to you. There's a portion of people who will rally and cry to get that machine gun nerfed, which means they want the machine gun to be made worse so that it doesn't overpower the other guns. They try and make something less fun so that more people are incentivized to use the other weapons. I think that is the worst way to look at things, and it bothers me how much those people get listened to. Rather than nerfing one weapon, rather than making one weapon less fun, the focus should be on buffing the other weapons, making the other weapons better so that if you chose them, you would have just the same advantage as the machine gun. Does that make sense to you? Stop worrying about nerfing other people and stop worrying about trying to make other people more like you. Try to make yourself better. Try and buff everything that you can. Like, we should be focused on raising everything. We should be focusing on raising the tides rather than draining some of the water. Does that make sense? I'll, I'll never understand the idea of making something worse so that it blends in with other things rather than making everything else better. It's so, it's so bizarre. Uh, now maybe we can get to the most important thing. The Chinese cartoon was pretty cool, but have you seen this? I think it's just called like Emote Portrait Alive, I'm pretty sure. Generating expressive portrait videos with audio to video diffusion model under weak conditions. It's basically a lip syncing model that does way more than lip syncing. It, it contorts the face in such a realistic way. It's able to move the neck. It's able to emote from a 2D image. It's as bizarrely futuristic as you can imagine. Like it's, it's honestly difficult to talk about. And I wonder what the reception would have been if it had been shown off before Sora. Unfortunately, Sora was the giant wave and now any really big wave just it doesn't compare even though it really does so this thing is able to you could argue it's like it's able to create lifelike video that never happened it's just as powerful as Sora for most applications like the idea of an interview like if you see an interview of a talking head it so does not have to be real and that is really dangerous how do you deal with that first of all OpenAI and Midjourney are labs that have created products and services that other people can pay money for. A lot of AI labs are just about research and like they're not necessarily creating products. And I don't think this Emote Portrait Alive is a product. I'm pretty sure it was made. The research was done by this Chinese company, I think. And it's just a proof of concept to show the comparison of other lip syncing models versus theirs and how good theirs are. Now, I don't know if this research is able to be bought by other companies. I don't know. I don't know how that all works behind the scenes, because if you're going to show something like this and another company is working on their own, but they see how good yours is, what if they just want to give you the money for the research and pretend like you made it for them? Like something along those lines might happen. So what I'm saying is that I don't think we have to like worry about being tricked right now. But again, in a couple months, that might change. And how would you combat We'll call it deep fakes. How would you combat fake artificial video? I think, I think that the punishment would have to be so severe that you wouldn't even attempt to get away with it. I think this type of technology is, it's not something that you can accidentally do. Like you're not accidentally going to clone someone's voice. So I think that cloning someone's voice should be a really, really severe punishment so that nobody even goes close to it. Now, I don't know what you think a severe punishment would be. I don't, I don't know, is that 10 days in jail? I don't know, is that 60 days in jail? Is that a year in jail? Like, no, it would have to be, 
Okay, let me put it this way. Drunk driving has a pretty serious offense, but I don't even think it's a big enough punishment because people still do it. Something along those lines, like, the reason you don't murder people is because you, you're you probably not going to get away with it, and and the downsides for you are so great that it's really not worth getting involved in. I think we need to treat generative AI in the same way because you have to deter people from even playing around with this stuff. I think if a politician wanted to fake support for their campaign, I'm telling you, this technology is so impressive that if you had a bunch of fake people talking heads saying, oh, I love, oh, I, I love that policy. I love what they're doing with the city. And you saw your city in the background. It's really hard not to be influenced by that. So how do you stop it? Like, how do you, I'm not saying I know the answer. I'm like literally asking you, like, how do you stop this technology from being used for bad if the answer is not really severe punishment for even trying to do it? Like, there's a reason you can't just make nuclear weapons. It's like a big process to go through that. It's because the danger is is real. So how do we make sure AI isn't played around with? I know there's a couple problems with that. Maybe the main one is, okay, if it's illegal for citizens, that's one thing. How do you know the government isn't just going to use it anyways? It's completely fair. I, I don't know. And the other thing I'm worried about, especially with my idea of punishment, is like, yeah, okay, so what? Make it illegal for Canadian citizens to use generative AI to create video from still images. Okay, it's illegal for us to do it. You're never going to see a fake social media post promoting something that hurts society. Okay, but how do you stop another country from doing that on your behalf or just to mess with your citizens? I don't want to pick a country, I don't, I don't want to create an enemy, but what if another country created a video of your local politician or a video of citizens supporting your local politician? If someone doesn't commit a crime within your borders, you, you typically can't go after them. So even if you somehow got the IP address, even if you knew the country that it originated from, like how, how could you bring those people to justice? It's a completely different system. So because the digital world is global. Like, how can you stop people from influencing others with fake videos? And maybe you're not worried about this, but like, think about your parents, think about your grandparents, think about yourself in 20 years when you might stop caring about things as much and you, you might not be as critical of every video you see. Think about yourself now. Like, I would have had the same conversation a year ago, but now seeing the new progress, how do you stop people from? abusing this technology. It's so good. Okay, on a lighter note, we can talk about Google's Genie AI. I think they're just calling it Genie. And what that is, is it takes a still image of something and it's able to create a video game out of it. Like a, a very rudimentary video game, but a video game nonetheless. Like if you took a screenshot of Flappy Bird, you remember that little bird game where you try to get it to go through the barriers? If you took a screenshot of that and fed it to Genie, Genie could add in some physics and make that bird fly. But the crazy thing is that it's able to generate more and more of the level. Like it's able to take that screenshot and expand it as you explore. That's really the first step towards what Midjourney has talked about for a long time, creating worlds, that these AIs are world engines and that you'll be able to simulate worlds and explore them. This is really the first step publicly. I don't know if Midjourney has had their own versions of this, maybe. And maybe a month ago or even longer, the Midjourney CEO talked about having a hollow deck by the end of this year. And he was kind of joking and I thought he was joking. But is is he? Is it gonna be possible to be in a room and maybe you have one of those treadmill floors where you keep walking but you always stay in the center? And the room around you just keeps expanding. You try and walk past the trees and the AI creates what exists past the trees. It, do it doesn't seem that far out of place. And I wonder, I wonder how video games are going to get made in the future when maybe you only need to create slices and then have the AI expand on those slices. And I'd really wonder... How long do you have to play inside that video game for the simulation to break down? How sophisticated is it? How coherent is it over time? 
Can you save what you create? Can you establish what's on the other side of that tree and sort of like save that in place so that the next time you go past that tree, it knows what to create? And then can you just like keep adding rungs on the ladder and, and keep exploring? Or do you always start in the same spot and whatever gets generated around you is always brand new? I don't, I don't know. And that reminds me, this is what I would bring up if you're having drinks over dinner and the conversation kind of gets quiet and someone's looking at you and, and they're wondering like, hey, is something wrong? Like, what's on your mind? This would be the scene in the movie. And I'd be sitting there and I'd, I have some apprehension about a particular thought. Something that, that has sort of stayed with me for the last week. So Sora gets announced, OpenAI shows off their video. And every week we get to hear the CEO of Midjourney talk about what they're working on and what they're thinking about. And he did not have a reaction to Sora. It, it, it didn't sound like it bothered him. He didn't sound particularly impressed with it. I can elaborate on that. We've never seen Midjourney's video. They've worked on video stuff. He's never been quite happy with it. But what he has said is that when you take a still frame of Sora and you take a still frame of Midjourney's video, Midjourney looks better because Midjourney's art generator is better. It's its image generator is it's high it's a higher quality. And like that that you can understand, but we're not talking about single images, we're talking about video. But if you know how video works, it's just a bunch of frames of single images that when you play it looks like motion. So has Midjourney been capable of Sora's ability for a lot longer than we would have had any idea because he had always said that he didn't think other generators looked very good and that what they were going to do was going to be good but that was before Sora so OpenAI shows what they can do and everyone's like oh my god like that's this is insane like what are we getting ourselves into should we be worried how is Midjourney going to compete with that and like and <laughs> And then to sort of pose that question, or at least have an open conversation with the CEO, and for him not to like acknowledge any of our anxiety, like it didn't, it didn't bother him. How could Sora not bother him enough to admit it to people he's talking to? Either he knew about it and had time to digest, that's completely possible. Maybe he knew about it, knew what they had created, and realizes that Maybe they're on the trajectory of the same sort of thing, or maybe what they have is similar enough to where he sort of lived with that reality for a lot longer than any of us. Not just knowing what they could do, but knowing what themselves, what they could do. And I think it definitely gives me some sort of comfort to, you know, witness some strength from someone you look up to. It's certainly helpful. But again, I think that's like a really key piece of the puzzle was that he he didn't seem phased by Sora. And I, I, I don't know how that's how it blows my mind. How could you what do you know that would make you not scared of something like that? So interesting. So that's definitely been on my mind. Like he didn't really react to it. I think you can see it in my eyes. Like I'm, I'm still flustered by it. I'm like, what what are they cooking over there? What are they cooking over there that these sort of jumps don't get a reaction? I don't know. Okay, one last interesting thought. And this came from a YouTube comment. I think it was about the idea of Genie, Google Genie, the creating video games. And this Reddit comment was really interesting. It said that right now in video games, you can customize your character. You can put them in silly outfits. You can rearrange their face to make it look like you or make it look like Shrek or anybody. And then when the cutscenes in the video game play, you'll see your custom character interacting with other characters and basically like you're in the video game. Your character is in the video game. Your experience watching your character is different than other people watching their characters. Cool. We, we know that's possible. It's been done for a long time. This commenter pointed out how that might be applied to movies in the future where like maybe you get to bring a custom character into a movie and maybe your character can become the main character of the movie, of the show, of the film, of the of the episode and that like you would be able to make your person look however you want them to look could there be some sort of interaction with media that way i think that's a really wild idea and i could see that being a lot of fun thank you for joining me this week 
I really appreciate it. I don't have anyone else to talk to about this kind of stuff. So thank you for listening. I hope you're doing well. Take care and I'll see you next time. Peace.